How's everybody? Hi. Hey. Can you hear me okay? Good. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, it's okay. good for me. Awesome. So I'm going to bring you guys. We were just watching the Thought Cafe's Trappist One. So yeah, me... fantastic. I could hear it in the background. Awesome. Yeah. Let me, and it's, let's see if it actually works. Maybe it will let me do the, the capture on this. It might not. Um, and then, actually, do you want to introduce yourself while I'm doing this stuff with the configuration of, of OBS streaming software? Yeah, Dan, who are you? Yeah, Dan. Uh, so I'm Dan Tamayo. I'm a, I'm a postdoc at the University of Toronto at Scarborough and the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Uh, yeah, I'm an interested in anything to do with planets going around stars <laughs> awesome uh, have you decided where you're going next uh not 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 yet no yeah still trying to decide you guys can see my lovely background now <clears throat> it's all good it's okay nothing exciting um but yeah you guys have a link in here for him Sorry, I, I, large Canada representation here. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, that, that video is actually really, 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 really good. That was really well done. Um, yeah, so. It was a super fun project. Uh, like I was working on writing a, a paper about that system and Matt, who you heard from in the video, is next door to me at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. And he was, you know, he's amazing. Like before doing astrophysics, he did a master's in jazz guitar. He's a super creative guy. Uh, and he had the idea of putting everything to music. Um, so we got that started. And then we knew these people at Thought Cafe who are these amazing animators. Um, so we got in touch with them to, to do all the visuals for it. Uh, and it all came somehow together <laughs> in time uh, for for a press release and all the stuff that came out from that. Yeah, and so <clears throat> I didn't know that there was a whole thing for, for system sounds. I had no idea. Um, and when we were listening to that, someone actually, I, and this is a question that I, I think could, we can kind of lead off of, uh, is how rare is that, that kind of resonance in a planetary system? Uh, yeah, it's it's the longest uh, resonant chain that we know of, right? Like where you have integer ratios and the times it takes planets to go around, you know, between a pair of planets and the next pair of planets and the next pair of planets. You know, you find isolated instances, pairs of planets out in the sample of planets that, that Jason helps discover and characterize. Um, but, you know, a chain like that, uh, we don't know of any, and even chains of three or four are really rare. Yeah. So, so tell us about about Trappist. Um, what is your work on that, or exoplanet discovery in in general? And then maybe talk about what's unique about Trappist, or uh, kind of what we know about it then and now. Yeah. So, I mean, what what has everybody excited about it is that. Um, it's seven planets, you know, the size of the Earth. So we know they're they're rocky, right? Like they're not like Jupiter, super gaseous. Like you know, you could have you could have things on the surface. Um, uh, and in addition to that, um, two or three of the planets are sort of the right range of temperatures that they could host liquid water. There's some questions around that. It's an around it's around um, a really um, low mass star is pretty active, so that can um, that can cause it to, to strip the atmospheres of these planets. So there's questions about whether you could sustain uh, like a liquid ocean on the top. Um, but you know these are the questions that that everybody's asking and trying to figure out. Uh, and on a pragmatic level, it's it's actually one of the 300 closest stars to us. Mm -hmm. So that means that. Um, it's a fantastic target uh, to follow up with all the best telescopes that we have. And um, 
the James Webb, which is launching next year uh, and is the successor to Hubble, will be a really good um, tool for that. And plans are already being made to observe these planets with it. Yeah, and someone just said, is Trappist-1 or orbiting a red dwarf star? It is. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, it's 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 right at the boundary. This star is, is so pathetic. It's, it's just barely able to, to fuse hydrogen. If it, if it was any less massive, it wouldn't be hot enough in its core to fuse hydrogen, and it wouldn't be a star. It would be uh, a brown dwarf. Yep. And in that whole system, if I'm right, you can drop that whole system, that solar, that solar system with Trappist, you can drop it within the orbit of Mercury. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's so low mass that, that everything is just packed. Uh, because it's just one star, um, you know, so if you put planets that close to our sun, they would just get, you know, fried. But um, this star is so small that even though the planets are so close in, um, they can receive about as much energy from their stars as we do on the Earth from ours, much further away. Right, right. Yeah, it's okay, guys. It's it, it's <laughs> they're like because sometimes you're you're breaking up just a little bit, but it's okay. It happens. Um, oh, it's it's okay. It's video. It's interwebs. Um, and. Um, all my subs, thank you guys. If you guys notice, I, I'm going to just continue on, but I will, I do appreciate that. Um, and so, sorry. So yes. So, so as far as, uh, the orbits and then, and yes, it is orbiting a red dwarf star. Um, and these are different kinds of stars. They're kind of weird. They're not. We, we've seen... I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, why do we care? Who cares about these M dwarf stars compared to other stars? Yeah, uh, well, I think there's, there's two big reasons uh, that Jason, of course, already knows. <laughs> uh, but and I do you know, too. He's just being know. a good. He's just being. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No. It's, it's this. He, he's asking me to say the things I I, I should have said. Um, so, so the first reason is that you know the way that we're finding these planets is as they pass in front of the star. Um, you know, we're just observing the light from these stars, which will be steady, but then when a planet passes by, you see it dip. Um, right, so if you imagine an Earth going around um, our sun, um, that's only going to block, uh, let's see if I get this right, uh, it's going to block one part in 10,000, is that right, Jason? <clears throat> uh, of the light from the sun. Um, but if you imagine the same Earth, uh, but now you put it around a much smaller star, then that Earth is going to block a much larger fraction of the star's surface, and that dip is going to be much more pronounced. So you can see smaller planets around smaller stars. You can see Earths much more easily around these small stars. And then the other reason is that if you look, if you take a galactic census of what all the stars that make up our galaxy, um, what they are, uh, it turns out that there are a lot more low mass planets, a lot more of these red dwarfs than there are of more massive stars like like our sun. So they dominate the galactic population. So anything that we can learn about um, habitability uh, or any property that we might be interested in around these low mass stars, that immediately has a big impact into what the the total rate that we should expect in the galaxy and the universe as a whole. So what did you do um, for the TRAPPIST system specifically? Yeah, so so when that paper was announced, you know, this like huge uh, press release, the paper is amazing. Um, but then in the supplementary information to the paper, they also said that, you know, well, here are all the parameters that we got for the system. But actually, when we take the solutions that we find observationally and we put those on a computer, we run them forward in time, um, planets start colliding with each other um, in a million years, uh, which is sounds like a lot, but that is just a tiny fraction of the lifetime of the system. So there's just no way that that can be right, right? Like we're we're finding a system which is billions of years old, and we're saying that we're finding it, you know, in the just the blink of an eye before the whole system falls apart. Um, 
So as somebody who's interested in, in orbital dynamics, um, that really caught my attention, uh, you know, that we must be missing something um, that actually makes the system much more stable than, than we think it is just from the observation. Um, I have a question and, and if, well, I'm sorry, if you, if you have anything yeah. else. Okay. Cause actually you I was going to ask this. Like, so why don't we just jump back and forth? Yeah, no. And that's how I like to do it. I don't like to keep it super formal, but some people, some people don't like it when I just interject and I don't want to interject. I want to interrupt. Um, Joe, you had the question, how come rocky planets uh, only orbit Trappist? Uh, why is it, why is it only rocky planets mm -hmm. that orbit Trappist mm -hmm. one? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it just turns out to be that way. It, you know, it's also important to, to say that, um, we're really biased towards only finding the planets that are closest to the star. You know, we're finding all these planets that are right packed up against it. Um, so there's nothing to say that um, there shouldn't be more planets further out that we just haven't been able to see. And maybe those could be bigger. They might be more like Neptune, more gaseous. Um, and what's, what's the difficulty yeah. with detecting exoplanets, especially um, ones nearby? Um, well, so that's kind of a very so, broad question, I know, but well, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, right? So the, 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 the big problem is that, um, planets are way, way fainter than the stars that they orbit, right? It's like, if you're just looking at the reflected light from a planet, it's like, you're looking for a Christmas light when somebody's put it, you know, right in front of you know, football stadium floodlight. Uh, it's really hard to pick out that really small signal when you're just being blinded by the star. Um, so we've only started to be able to do that. Like only a handful of planets have been imaged directly in that way. Um, but the vast majority of the thousands of planets that have been discovered, um, those have had to be found uh, through more clever indirect ways. So one of those, the one that's been most successful is this transit method that I mentioned before, that you just watch the light from a star, which will be steady, but by chance, the orbit is oriented in such a way that it passes right in front of the star um, relative to our line of sight, right? And when it does that, it blocks part of the star's light and you see a dip in the intensity from that light. And you just keep monitoring hundreds of thousands, millions of stars, and you look for the ones that, that have planets in the right plane. Most of them will not. Um, but, you know, if you, if you look at enough, uh, you'll, you'll find some. So I have a, another question for you. Um, the modeling that you're using, that you, so the, the dynamical modeling you do of these different systems, uh, what's, I, presumably you're using uh, the rebound code. Why don't you tell us about that code and like why it's so special? Uh, sure. And so you can go into detail. It doesn't have to be Trappist specific. Sure. Um, so since coming to Toronto, um, I've been working a lot with Hanno Rhein, who's a professor here on this rebound code. Uh, it's, it's a code specifically for, uh, for numerically modeling the orbits of, of planets and satellites. Um, so we put a lot of time into that. Uh, and it's actually pretty easy to use. It's it's online, it's open source, and it has a bunch of examples. So I mean, anybody that's, that's listening to this could install it, open up one of the examples, and start just modifying things to put planets in different orbits. It's fun to play around with. Uh, and that's actually what I use to, uh, to make the movies that we that we put in um, for the Trappist-1 animation, right? So I was actually taking one of our numerical integrations from Rebound, and I modified the code to to output uh, a MIDI note every time a planet passed in front of the star. Um, right, so uh, so that that's what I was using for, for studying the Trappist-1 system, you know, basically just trying to come up with different configurations um, uh, and seeing which ones were going to be stable. So my 
my intuition, you know, when I read the paper was that the big problem that, that you're going to have, um, when looking at the system is that, uh, it's very difficult when you're finding planets in this way to measure how elliptical the orbits are. Uh, and because these, pl these planets are in this very special configuration of, you know, for every, um, for every two orbits of the outermost planet, the next one in does three, then the next one in does four. Um, they're very, they're very regular. This actually make the system extremely sensitive to the exact values of how elliptical these orbits are. Um, because it turns out that around these resonances is where chaos creeps into these planetary systems and causes planets to become orbit crossing and eventually collide with one another. Um, so that's that's sort of what, what got me interested in the system. And what we did for the paper is instead of just guessing at the eccentricities because we don't have those observationally, is we tried to simulate the formation of the system where we imagine the system forming in the disk of gas and dust out of which planets form. Uh, and when they're in that disk, they, they move relative to one another. So we, we model that stage um, to try and smoothly bring the planets to um, tune themselves to one another into the right values into the right configurations and ellipticities for the resonant configuration that we observe. And as soon as we did that, then all the configurations, the vast majority were stable for very long time scales. Yeah, someone was asking. Okay, so I want to go into a little bit more detail. The Lagrange. Um, no, okay, you addressed that. Never mind. Sorry, sorry. Oh. Um, so you have, so this code is publicly available. Um, it has a Python interface because Several people in the chat um, have some background in computer science. One of the things that I thought was really impressive about this code um, um, when we went to that conference in Aspen is that they changed the way. So one of the problems that you run into when you run different types of software on different computers is that you actually get different numbers. So you mentioned that uh, in these planetary orbits that if it goes if it even small deviations from one of the initial conditions um, can cause the system to go completely unstable um, you can get dramatic uh, differences in the output even with microscopic changes um, to the planet parameter inputs uh, let me add my so people can see my face um, so that that's chaos that's uh, you you inject a small change. And in some cases, the changes, like when they study chaos in the solar system, they'll make changes like the thickness of your thumbnail. And some fraction of the time, Mercury will slam into Venus or something like that. Um, so that same thing happens. And it can actually happen with, if you take exactly the same initial conditions, like the same input parameters, and run it on a different computer, you can get a different result. So this is a common problem in in writing code. But the way they did rebound is they rewrote, tell, tell me if I'm wrong, but they rewrote all of the math functions so that you would always get exactly the same result regardless of what computer you ran it on. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, the, C, the, the code is written in C, and the C standard only... Um, only guarantees that you get machine independence and unbiased results for all the arithmetic operations, you know, plus minus times divided by, uh, and the square root function. If you have any trigonometric functions or exponentials or anything else, uh, then those functions are really heavily optimized for your hardware. You know, what specific architecture you have. So different people running uh, the same operations will get slightly different answers, right? They're obviously close, but they'll differ sometimes in the last bit. Um, and for these kinds of applications that are chaotic, right, those very small differences grow exponentially. So even if you just make a tiny mistake in the last bit, after a while, you just get the entire thing completely different. 
that's a, the the solar system is a great example, right? So, so there's this really influential study that was done in 2009 that was varying the position of Mercury by the width of your fingernail, uh, you know, 2,000 different times, you know, because we don't know the position of Mercury to much, much bigger errors than that. So any any value that you pick around there is going to be, you know, a good as good a guess as any. Um, and, you know, they use this supercomputing cluster in France and use 5 million CPU hours to run these 2,000 systems for the age of the solar system. And they found that 1% to 2% of these cases, Mercury crashes into the sun or crashes into Venus. Okay, so now I come along and I say, oh, well, those are really interesting cases, right? Let me look at those cases and let me see exactly what happened that, that let you got into collision course with the sun or onto collision course with Venus. If I run those cases on my computer, I'll get a completely different answer. Like Mercury will never hit the sun or will never hit Venus. And if I want to get those 1% of cases and the entire 2000 systems, 5 million CPU hours to get the tiny subset, the one or 2% that will be different, but the, the cases that will that will run to the sun or Mercury. Um, so yeah, so, so that's, that's something that, that we're really excited about and I think can, can help move the field forward and make it much easier for us there's results uh, easily. I just had someone ask uh, where we would find the implementation. I'm looking for, I know you uh, have the source, you had some of, I know, I know you have a GitHub, but I don't know if that's something that you openly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so can I, like, can people see what I type in the chat? If you have a. Did you, did you did you create a a thing, <laughs> or if you have if wait well, you no know, you know Twitch, um. Well, so I, I'm on I'm on Google Hangouts, but oh, so if I go to, if I go to if I go to your channel on Twitch, I can type in the chat there. Yeah, if you have an account, if you don't, um, Google uh, Rebound I, Code. So the way I find it is, I just Google the Rebound Code, just oh, type in true. Rebound Code into Google, and it, there's a GitHub page. Okay. Yeah. Rebound code? Yeah. Welcome to Rebound. That's right. Oh, okay. All right, guys. Wow. That's actually really cool. Whoa. Information. Love it. Okay, so this is it right here. So I just posted in chat for everybody. Because we have a lot of computer people. Uh, I mean, besides myself. Um, Great. Yeah. So if you go like on that page, on the main page down, mm -hmm. there's just a, a quick read me. There's a link there to the documentation that's rebound.readthedocs.org. And that has information on how to install it and um, lots of, you know, how to get started, basically. So, so yeah. yeah, it is. So, so parts of it are written in C. Hopefully we have some C programmers up in here. <laughs> okay. Go on, Dr. Stefan. Oh, so um, I, I want to just hit this a little bit more because um, this is big stuff. I'm always I'm always fascinated by things that I don't know anything about, um, and Hanno uh, is, is, is I mean a friend of both of us. Um, he's really, really good at his coding. His coding is amazing. Um, yeah, he's a wizard. He could leave tomorrow and go to Google. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, there's better there are better places to work than that. But, um, he could. So one of the things that he has in his code is it's actually got several different integrators. Um, how, how many are there? I, I can think of at least three. Um, yeah, there are, there are five, I think. Yeah. And and they all are optimized to do different things. Um, That's right. So, uh, so there are three, I guess, in particular that I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your take on. Um, so one of them is this, uh, they did the math to like, so when you do these calculations of planets interacting with each other, you can um, do math to kind of predict where the planets are going to be and to be able to use those estimates to refine, like to make the calculation go faster. Um, and so typically those will be done to like, uh, what's called fourth order. So you do like four corrections and then you add everything up and you get this thing that integrates, that calculates the position using um, four levels of correction to the to the equations of motion. 
but one of the ones that he that they wrote into Rebound has 15 corrections. It's 15 orders of corrections that go into um, the calculation. And so as a consequence, <clears throat> um, there's more math in the front end, like when you're actually putting the code together. But then the speed, so what's the, like what does the speed matter and how does this affect the speed? Like if you were to compare like Rungi cut a four, fourth order to this one that's 15th order. Uh, well, so, so what, so what that, what that, um, what that integrator is really good at is it's really good at giving you really precise answers. It, it, it always integrates the orbits of the planets down to the precision of the machine, so down to 16 digits. Um, so yeah, and the reason for that is like you said, it's 15th order. So that means that if you, for any integrator, you're gonna get a better answer, the smaller time step you take in between. Right? So if you just do calculations every 10 days, uh, you're gonna do better than if you took steps every 20 days because you're just getting more things wrong. Um, so with a 15th order integrator, if you decrease your time step by a factor of two, which makes your code take twice as long to run because uh, you're taking twice as many steps, um, that decreases your error by two to the 15th power, which is 32,768. So uh, whereas with a fourth order Rangakata, that would decrease you by the fourth. Um, so it's really good at giving you very precise answers when you want to get everything exactly right. Okay, so you cut out there for a second. So the, with the kind of workhorse um, integrator, the one that most a lot of people use is the fourth order one. So what you're saying is if you double the step size, or if you cut the step size in half, yeah. that the traditional method, uh, we'll pretend it's traditional. So the traditional method, which is the fourth order, you'll get basically a factor of 10 or so improvement in the precision of your answer. And you're saying with this uh, 15th order one, you get a 30,000, it's 30,000 times um, as precise when you reduce the step size by half. That's right. Wow. That's yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just like doing faces. I don't even need to say anything. I think all my chat's kind of like 15 orders damn nice. And then USM says, <laughs> 15 orders, good game. <laughs> so uh, there's there's another one uh, that this thing has, and this, this one blew my mind when I saw it, um, is that one of the problems you run into with integrators like this is that if you run the clock forward, you'll get somewhere, but there's always errors that creep in. Like you mentioned, there's always errors that creep in at the end. And so you can't take something and run the clock backwards and recover what you started with. Um, so you, going forwards is one thing, but then when you take a position, like at some later date, and then try to run it backwards, you don't get what you started with. Um, so that's like, it's not, time reversal symmetric, so you can't um, slide it around. And so, um, Hano, I guess, was just goofing around. I was like, hmm, I wonder if I can fix that. And then he made this integrator that reproduces exactly the, the integration, whether you go forwards in time or backwards in time. Um, and he had- Yeah, that was a fun project. Uh, yeah, I feel like that's like a, is a very philosophical project, right? That- Yeah, yeah. To simulate our are supposed to be time reversible, but the codes that we write are not. Um, um, so yeah, it's, it's a cool code. It means that that if if you have a system that just blows up, like planets start crossing by each other and they eject from the system, the whole thing just blows apart. You could then, starting from your blown apart system, integrate backwards in time and see the planets come back into the system and circularize and then come back into a nice configuration. We we need to have you back a lot because this is this is some <laughs> the, the, yeah everybody's kind of wow um, this is amazing and I, I think people because you know I don't do a lot of the code stuff on here um, I would hate to code on stream that would be terrible never happening guys um, but this stuff is super super cool. Yeah, I have a bunch of coders in here too. I can I already know a few of them. Um so this kind of goes into, I mean, obviously we've kind of taken a step into it and a lot of people if you don't code, what we're talking about is how you integrate um you know, well we can actually get into a little bit of 
Uh, actually, that, that's a good segue into how they're using machine learning now to detect new exoplanets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do, can, you, can you expand on that? Um, yeah, so uh, I haven't read the paper carefully, but I know that um, there's um, an astronomer who's a grad student. He's a, a at the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard. Um, he's like a superstar in the field, he just writes tons of really influential papers. He teamed up with a software engineer from Google um, and they tried to uh, generate a machine learning pipeline to detect planets uh, uh, from that have been detected by the Kepler mission. Right? Uh, and, Jason's been really involved in Kepler and, you know, Kepler, the pipeline for Kepler, the standard pipeline for Kepler, I think already involves some machine learning, mm -hmm. um, but they try to take a different approach and they were actually able to find an additional planet in the system that, that already had six or seven planets. So, um, so that was. Now you do some machine learning in your research as well. What, what do you use it for? Uh, that's right. Um, so, I'm interested in planetary systems that blow up, you know, Naturally. systems like the, <laughs> the fun stuff. Like, what's go that? On. I said the fun stuff. Go on. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so system like the solar system, right? Where you would look out today and think that this is the most boring thing you could imagine. These things are just going to go on their orbits forever. But actually, if you wait long enough, you could find out that Mercury is going to crash into the sun or crash into Venus. Um, so I'm really interested in that question of how chaos creeps into planetary systems and how long will it take for that to happen? That's actually an interest that Jason and I both share. Um, so that's actually a problem that I think is actually is, is the oldest unsolved problem in physics. If I give you a planetary configuration, can you tell me whether that's going to be a stable system and, uh, if it's not, how long is it going to take for planets to start crashing into one another? You know, so Newton wondered about this with our solar system, and people have been working on it ever since. And working on that question has actually driven a lot of the progress in nonlinear dynamics and chaos uh, over the last century. It's gravity. Um, so, you know, my approach was, well, I could try to do some of the same things that people have been doing for a while. Or I could try to uh, apply some new machine learning tools uh, to see whether they, those could be useful for this kind of for this kind of problem. And it turns out they are. So we we trained um, we trained a machine learning algorithm just on thousands of um, numerical integrations that we ran with Rebound. So what, um, what do you mean by train? Right. So yeah. So let me back up. So so with you know, the traditional programming that we do is we'll write some code that will carry out a sequence of operations to do what we want it to do. So if we want it to, to tell us whether system's stable, then we'll say, well, figure this out first, then figure this out, then figure this out, and then give us our answer. Um, with machine learning, with supervised machine learning, the idea is different, that what the algorithm does is it learns from examples. You don't, you don't tell it what to do step by step. You just feed it a bunch of examples, and then you, you let the algorithm learn from those examples how to predict on new ones that it hasn't seen before. Um, so, so that's what we did. We generated a big data set of examples uh, using Rebound. We just took a bunch of different planetary configurations, numerically integrated them forward to see whether they were stable or not. And then we gave those initial configurations to the machine learning algorithm with the answer, stable, not stable, stable, not stable, stable, stable. Um, and then once it's trained on that, um, we then see how it does on systems that it's never seen before. And it actually does a really good job. Um, so we're working on expanding those capabilities and making it a code that's easy for, for people to use and apply for a bunch of different applications. Yeah, so I'm reading, I'm actually showing the, the article, it's Wired, I didn't go with the NASA article. And it's exactly the process he was just talking about, guys, where you kind of train it to recognize certain things. Does that use neural networks? So or yeah, I think, 
the yeah. the ones that um that the one i was talking about before i think does neural networks those are algorithms that are very good for tasks like image recognition or like you know with kepler you have the light curves you have the light that you're seeing from the star and then you see dips with noise superimposed on that so it's again it's a pattern recognition exercise um, so that's a task that neural networks are very powerful for. Um, for what we were doing for predicting the stability of planetary systems, um, we were using um, gradient boosted decision trees. So de decision trees are just saying, you know, for each example, for each system that you have, you have a bunch of information about each of them, right? Like you know where the planets are, you know how elliptical they are, you have all these parameters. So a decision tree will say, Okay, let's look at this parameter. Is it bigger than this value? Yes or no? And it'll split on that on that tree. Um, and then it'll ask a different question at this node, and it'll split again. Right. So it looks like it, it's a decision tree that goes all the way down until you have an answer at the bottom. Um, then a really popular simple algorithm in machine learning is called random forest, which is just taking a forest of these decision trees and letting each tree vote on what it thinks the answer is averaging over the entire forest to give you one answer. Um, and what's made gradient boosted decision trees a really powerful algorithm is that now what they're doing is they're building a forest just like random forest, but the way that they introduce trees into the forest, they make up for the weaknesses or deficiencies of previous trees in the forest. So the, so the trees in your forest are actually complementary to one another. Um, and then they're much better able um, to make uh, good classifications. So the, de the decision tree thing, um, this forest of decision trees, I think that's what Kepler uses in their machine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's yeah. what that's what we're seeing. It's, it's definitely a neural network, um, I think. Yeah, they, they gave, so it says right here, the, the data set was too large to fit on their desktop at work. Uh, so they downloaded the data set, uploaded it to the cloud, and then they delete part of the part of that, what they downloaded. Um, they give it a neural network, a bi they give the neural network a binary task and tell them which files in Kepler's terabytes of, of data contain exoplanets. Um, and so it looks like they have about 200,000 stars worth of data to study. Uh, and I, I know that they can get the precision. I think the precision, like for detecting exoplanets, was around like ninety six percent. I have read the the, the actual publication, um, but it, it, I, that was that was a while ago. Um, but yeah, so this can this. I mean, having people having to go through this and then actually taking that out of the equation, having something like machine learning to be able to look at other other stars and and transit signals. Um, that that significantly, uh, yeah. I haven't read this actual article though fully. Um, it's very very cool. Uh, Dr. Stefan, did did you think that this this was possible when you first started working? Because you you started working with Kepler at the very very beginning, yeah. Yeah, you we were both just, probably um, did. When I started working with Kepler, we were um, scratching. We would take a burnt stick and a piece of uh, bark, and we'd scratch on the bark with the burnt stick to, to do our calculations. <laughs> um, I was there at the very, very beginning of, well, not not the very, very beginning of the process, but they were still writing the first version of the pipeline, and so all throughout the mission, all throughout the Kepler mission lifetime, and even after, they kept making um, changes to the pipeline, and then they would run it on all the data, and then they would make more changes, and then they'd run it again. Um, I think that the final version was lot was like. I think it was like the ninth, like SOC 9. Um, so it was like 9.0 is the version or something like that that they that they had run. So it, it had gone through many different iterations where they would add certain things because a lot of the issue that they ran into was first, when they first started doing it, the computer would spit out anything that it thought was interesting and then we'd have to go through by hand mm -hmm. and study each individual system to see if it looked like a planet or not. And so there was a lot of classification that was done by eye, um, which is not good if you want to do 
a good statistical analysis of your uncertainties in your ability to, to detect things. You want to remove the humans as much as possible um, so that you can, because when you remove the humans, you can generate gigantic um, catalogs of fake data and run that through your system to see uh, how frequently you correctly identify the fake data. Um, and you can't do that with humans. It would just take too long. But you can do it with a computer if you remove the humans from the algorithm. And so the whole, for almost a decade, the, the people at NASA Ames who were developing the pipeline were looking at this um, to get it out of the humans and completely onto the computer. So, no, but you use, um, so going back to your work, Daniel, you use um, machine learning for different than, so they used it to, to be able to detect planets. Mm -hmm. Um, and you used it for to see if the system was stable, right? That's right. Um, yeah. So, so you know, one of one of the tasks that that we need to go through when we discover new systems um, is you're always trying to figure out any of the parameters, right? So, so when you see a planet passing in front of the star, one thing that you can measure extremely precisely is the orbital period of this planet. Um, but you're also interested in all the other things, right? Like you're interested in the size, you're interested in how elliptical the orbit is, any information that you can get. Um, and uh, people run these, um, you know, big uh, statistical codes to to, to get um, the best estimates and the right uh, uncertainties for these parameters. Um, but, you know, one idea that, that we really want to, to push this machine learning stability code for is is the fact that you know you might have a fit that fits the data pretty well but if that orbital configuration is is unstable then then you can just rule that out completely right so um, so sort of building it into that process of trying to learn more about these systems and getting better estimates um, for what their orbital parameters and physical properties really are. Um, that's one of the main applications that, that we're thinking about for this. And that's uh, exactly what you're talking about with kind of TRAPPIST-1, is that seems to be a very stable um, orbital path with all of those those planets and how they're configured. But it's also very weird and rare. We haven't seen anything like that. Yeah, so that's, that's the perfect example, right? They, they had thousands of solutions that all went through all their data points, and those are the ones that they reported in the paper, but none of the ones that they tried were stable. Planets started colliding basically immediately on on astronomical timescales. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that's a case where, where this would help you enormously, right? You can rule out the majority of, of the solutions that you have, and it can help you narrow down on what, what the actual values are. And when you say they collide, um, and, and you did give us a time reference, and everybody here's, you know, they're they're aware of that millions of years when you're talking, uh, you know, our universe, our, our known universe being, you know, 13.8 billion, millions of years is kind of nothing. Um, but when you're saying that they collide, are you saying that basically their orbits actually decay or, you know, get jostled? Like the whole thing with, uh, I mean, you, you even do stuff with uh, – uh, I, I'm not even thinking. I, I've been working all day. Uh, Trans-Neptunian objects and things like that, you know, things that kind of get ejected in certain paths in a, in a solar system. Or I know you have stuff on that, too, where you talk about irregular satellites. Um, so not necessarily collisions, but maybe even ejections from the solar system. Is that accounted for in this in, in these algorithms? Yeah. Uh, so all that would be all that would be included. Uh, I'm oversimplifying a little bit. So for the millions of years, that's really a time scale on which the orbits start to, to cross one another and planets have close approaches that, that gravitationally cause them to gravitationally scatter mm -hmm. and they become more elliptical. And as soon as you start doing that, then the whole system just goes crazy. The eccentricities get big, things go out of the plane. They don't look at all like the system that we see today. Eventually, the planets will collide with each other. The problem is that space is so empty, right? These planets are tiny as a fraction of the volume of space that they orbit in. So you actually have to wait a long time for these, you know, tiny 
pinpricks to find each other in space and collide. But they'll come by each other closely and they'll scatter and cause a huge mess. Um, so I, I'm oversimplifying, but but um, yeah, that 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 that's what that's what can happen in these systems, and that's what we can rule out. You know, when we see a nice orderly system, we can rule out that there's going to be some one of these, you know, events that's going to send the whole system into a huge mess uh, within a million years. And before all the Planet X comments, but. Um, <laughs> I'm, I bet there, there are people thinking maybe that's what happened. Um, have you guys done any simulations with the, with Mike Brown's, uh, you know, information that he has on, on all of that? Uh, I've, I've looked into it. I, I've consciously decided not, not to, to poke that problem with a nine foot pole. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing would be more exciting, um, the way I see it is you could either prove it wrong, in which case nobody likes you, or you could figure out, you know, where it is or whatever, but then, you know, Mike Brown and Constantine are going to get all the credit. So right. <laughs> uh, there's, there's not a big carrot there, right. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, I guess this is a yeah. good time if anybody, or if Dr. Stefan, it's the last 15, I want to make sure if anybody has damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. Um, if anybody has any questions for him regarding anything, I know that we've kind of read some questions, but, oh, well, Bill Nash has one. Is collision in a literal, is it, is collision a literal sense or merely an interaction of gravity that causes the orbit to change permanently? Yeah. So, so that, that is the issue, right? That if, if you imagine just two small balls going around in space, it's really hard for them to, to actually collide. Much, there's a much bigger target for them to just come close to one another and scatter, right? So, so there'll be many, many scatterings before you get lucky enough or unlucky enough if you're on the planet for the for the bodies to actually collide. But collisions definitely do happen, right? Like that, that is how we think that terrestrial planets actually form. There's a phase at the end where you have, you know, things the size of the Moon or Mars that are actually colliding with one another. So. So, so these things happen. That, that's how you know we our think moon. our own moon came from a collision between a Mars-sized body and the Earth, right? So that was a bad day on Earth. Yeah, so that's actually um, the stuff that I'm working on with my graduate student that we talked a little bit about in China um, is that we are actually looking at how long, like what's the difference between just having a close encounter and actually having a collision and how does, uh, like, how long does a system go through encounters before there's a collision and stuff like that? And so, um, you know, a system can go unstable fairly early, but in answer to the question that was asked uh, in chat, um, my graduate student is looking directly at like, what are the collisions like? What happens when you have these collisions? And in fact, uh, where I was, one of, one of my former graduate students, um, he was modeling using smooth particle hydrodynamics, like doing SPH calculations, about what happens if you take planets like uh, Neptune, like a Neptune-like planet, and you collide them together. What happens to all the gas? What happens to all the rock and, and everything? Um, so uh, we do actually need to understand that because it can have consequences that we'd be able to observe in a given system, right? If you have the collision and all the gas gets blown off, of planets, um, then it will change the density of the objects that are left over at the end, for example. Okay, and let's see, does anybody else have any questions? I know that Joe said, do we know of any systems that have blown up yet, aka probably have had any kind of collisions? Uh, yeah, so we see, I think we see a lot of evidence of that in the, the sample of planets that we discovered on other stars, just because we, we find a lot of systems that are much more like planets that are much more elliptical orbits than we find in our solar system. And that, that is exactly what you'd expect if you had systems that look more like our solar system, but then things are chaotic. So eventually planets sort of diffuse chaotically to a configuration where planets start crossing orbits and they have these scattering events. You know, if you send a planet close to Jupiter, that could eject the planet from the solar system and leave Jupiter on an elliptical orbit. Um, 
so I think, yeah, we, we definitely, uh, I'm pretty comfortable that what, that what we're seeing uh, in, in the exoplanet sample is, is a pretty violent history for a lot of these systems. Yeah, and there's another, this is actually a really good question. Uh, this may have been answered already, but what insight did the ML algorithm give us? Do we know what, what was missing from the initial model that was causing collisions to occur so frequently? Um, yeah, so, 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 so that's one thing that I'm interested in, in the, the machine learning work that I'm doing, right, is one, one worry with machine learning is that you can be left with this black box where you, you say, it's like this Oracle where you go with your, with your new orbital configuration and say, is this stable? And it says, yes. <laughs> and then you go back and then you ask, is this one stable? It says, no, but you have no idea what it's doing. Um, so I'm interested in sort of trying to look inside that black box. And uh, thankfully, a lot of algorithms do give you some opportunity to do that, right? So for example, in the the ones that, the one that, that we ended up using, one thing that you can ask it is you can ask it, which, which features of the ones that you're giving it for, you know, for each planetary system, you have a choice of what information do you give the algorithm for each planetary system. Um, and what it can give you back after you train it is it can give you a rank list of which features were most informative um, in helping it, you know, classify systems correctly. Um, so that gives you a chance to sort of go back and forth, right? You can have this great idea for, you know, you have this deep dynamical intuition of how chaos propagates through systems. So you can generate a feature from your initial orbital configuration that you think should be very important. And you can uh, see where that ends up on the final ranking. You know, and we had some great ideas that end up make, ended up making no difference whatsoever. Um, but then we had others that actually improved the performance substantially. So in that back and forth, we can we can learn a bit about the, the physics um, and, and hopefully develop a deeper understanding of, of chaos and uh, how it manifests itself and propagates in planetary systems. So that's interesting. So basically, um, you have this magic eight ball is right. basically what you've got. And the algorithm that you're using, um, it's a publicly available algorithm, right? Um, yeah, it, it's called XG Boost. You know, they run these machine learning competitions online, like at Kaggle.com. And for these kinds of classification problems where you just want an answer, yes or no, um, these end up winning like half of the competitions. Uh, so it's a really powerful algorithm for that kind of problem. But yeah, it's publicly available. And but it also allows popular. you to, it's, it's an eight ball that you can open up and actually get into the inner workings and see how it. And how what is fun. it called again? XG Boost. Okay. Yeah, yeah cause that's, all right. Oh yeah, I've seen the GitHub for it. Yep. Let's go with that. Here you guys go. If you guys want that, um, that's super neat. And then let's see here. So we've got there's some this, such good questions. What do the models say about the likelihood of stable orbits in the so-called Goldilocks zone? Um. Yeah, it, it'll it'll really depend, right? So the Goldilocks zone uh, is another word for the habitable zone. It's the right range of distances. You have a given star that's, you know, it puts out a certain amount of energy in its light. And there's a certain range of distances from that star in which you could have an orbit and it would have the right temperature to, to hold liquid water. The question of stability is is independent of that. And it really depends on, well, first you need to have more than one planet, and it depends on where the planets are relative to one another. But you can move the whole system in or out. Um, so you can move it into the habitable zone, you can move it out of the habitable zone, but that doesn't affect stability. Yeah, and I mean, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of things. It would be, you know, the various sizes of planets that are nearby, if any, also the size of the star, what stage of the star's life that it's even in, which would be indicative of its size and also its temperature. So there's a lot of things that would that would kind of go into that, I think. But still, um, that's still a good question because there's really yeah. no bad questions. Can the models potentially help predict future collisions? 
Um, no. So, so that's an interesting point, right? What we're saying is that these systems are chaotic, mm -hmm. but on some level we can't predict them, right? So the interesting thing is that, um, you know, just like we were talking about with the solar system, you can move it by a fingernail's width and you would get different results. Um, there's no way, there, there's no theory that we could come up with that would be able to tell you for a single one of those, you know, realizations where you choose a certain number of fingernail widths to start from, is that one going to collide with the sun or collide with Venus? Um, because the system's chaotic, we can just never know that. That's like, there's, there's a fundamental limit there. Um, but we can know something about a population of systems, right? So we don't know how many fingernail, you know, where exactly Mercury is. But if we take sort of a population that's right around that ballpark, um, then we can get an answer like that 1% or 2% in one or 2% are cases that it's going to collide. Um, so it's the same thing with this stability thing. Um, you know, uh, if we get the system is goes unstable after, you know, 200 million years, then that's not the final answer. There's going to be some distribution of, of times that similar systems would go unstable over. Um, so for these chaotic problems, we, we sort of have to think about populations. We can't think about individual systems or individual simulations. So one of the questions that we have in the chat is, do you have any movies? Uh, movies? We have lots of movies. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Hi, brain. Um, so let me, let me show you some, I'll, I'll put, let me put, oh, this one, this one's one of my favorites. So I'll send this to you. Um, I'll send this to you in the, in the, in the, Google Hangouts chat, Jason, maybe you can put it in the, in the Twitch chat. Okay. So you can also show it on your screen, um, or I could show it on my screen. Oh, I got uh, it. I got it. Oh, it's a YouTube video. Okay. I get yeah, it. Hard. I'm subjecting everybody to it right now. Yeah. So, so that's actually sonifying Saturn's rings. Mm-hmm. Right, so the Cassini mission, which is a spacecraft around Saturn, which is what I what I worked on in grad school, um, just ended. It it you know it crashed at the end of the mission. They crashed it into Saturn to avoid it um, polluting potential places for life, like like Enceladus, this this amazing moon that has a subsurface ocean that could be a place where you'd have life in the solar system. So we don't want to contaminate that, um, but. You know, it's been returning just fantastic images of Saturn's rings, Saturn's moons, and the best images that we've gotten have come at the end of the mission when it was able to get closer than it's ever been before. Um, so Matt put together uh, this movie. Uh, this is an actual image of Saturn's rings, and he's actually turning the um, the brightness of, you know, the brightness, which is a measure of the density in these rings, into into sound uh, and assigning them assigning them notes based on also also the brightness and I just think this this one's this was my favorite out of all the ones that we put together. Yeah, we can we can listen to it. I, I muted it so you can explain what we're because people are like, wait, there's sounds and blinking lights and rings <laughs> or lines. They might not know. You have to hear it. Yeah, no, it, and and I wanted to hear. It, uh, I wanted to see what it looked like first, and then yeah, but here we go. I'm starting it now.
<laughs> programming music. <laughs> yeah, you would say that. I would say that too. That's awesome. And there's the link. You guys can go to System Sounds. Apparently, there's a whole bunch of these, and I had no idea. This is amazing. Um, that's awesome. And soon we're going to add one uh, sonifying the, the solar system uh, in a really cool way that, that Matt came up with. Uh, so that should be up in the next month or so. Um, yeah, so he's he's just a, a nonstop fountain of, of amazing ideas. Uh, it's really fun nice. working with him. That's awesome. Yeah, I had no idea about any of that. Um, so we, we were watching some stuff before, but uh, System Sounds HTTP is probably configured properly. What? It's not configured properly? Is it not? Is it not bringing anything up if you do System Sounds? Is it? It's fine. Um, this is awesome. This is what we're going to do, guys. We're going to watch some of this stuff. Um, let's see. Someone, seems like someone has attacked to the site. Where? Where are you find for me? Oh, okay. Are you just, are you guys not doing that? Oh, wait, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Wait, I can't even, well, it didn't load on me. Huh. Well, does anybody have any other questions? I don't want to keep him too much longer. Um, and Dr. Stefan's ringing. Hold on. Oh, I'm, I have, sorry, that's, I was wondering, I thought that you were watching that. That was, uh, I went to the YouTube channel where that was happening. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, that we watched it. Having all these sounds, I'm like, Wow, that's uh, that's, so it actually reminds me a little bit. The first time I ever saw someone sonify like exoplanet data was um, Gaspar Bacos um, did it. Oh yeah. Berlin. And he he had just big like percussion sounds going, and it was the date that they were discovered is when they would come in. Um, oh, cool. And then there was one that was some 10 Jupiter radius, like some gigantic planet, I guess it wasn't 10 Jupiter radius, but it was like two and a half Jupiter radii or something like that. That came in like part way through and it was, he's like, oh, that's Wasp 48 or whatever it was. It was, <laughs> really funny. It was too. But hey, I really, I appreciate your time. I thought this was really interesting. Absolutely. It was really fun getting to talk to you. Yeah. Um, and everybody in here, um, you guys can check them out. Again, we've got the guest link and we'll go and look at some of this stuff. It'd be good to have him back so we can talk more about it. <laughs> Bookmark this site. That's awesome. Um, so, yes, thank you so much for your time, and you guys have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you Bye. both. Yeah, All thanks, right. Dan. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, so now you guys can see all of my stuff. Awkward.